Welcome to today's Energy Central webcast entitled Utility Network Implementation Best Practices from the World's Largest Electric Utility Network Deployment. We're thrilled to have with us today Jamie Chip, GIS Manager at First Energy, and Phil Dunn, Principal Solution Architect with SST Innovations. Phil, welcome to the event. You have the floor. Thank you, PJ. Um, assuming you can see my first slide. Okay, good morning and afternoon, everybody. Um, since we're all geographically dispersed across the country, so uh, welcome. Um, you're all here to hear about how First Energy uh, successfully transitioned over to the UN. So hopefully, Jamie Chips and I today can share some information that'll be useful to you. And we'll also give you some time at the end to ask some questions, but please go ahead and submit your questions along the way. Um, but we'll answer those kind of at the end. We'll have some time there to, uh, to answer those questions. So hey, just introducing our, ourselves, I'm Phil Dunn. I'm a principal solution architect at SSP Solutions. <clears throat> SSP Innovation, sorry. Uh, Jamie Chips is the GIS manager from First Energy. Um, Jamie was the, 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 the lead on the, the First Energy project on the First Energy side. Um, I was the lead for SSP Innovations. So we kind of worked together for four years on this project. So before we get started, um, just kind of want to do a couple of things. First, I want to go through the agenda. Um, and just tell everybody um, kind of what we're going to cover today. And then I'm going to ask everybody a, a question that's on the call. So we'll have a poll question after that. So what we're going to cover first, we're going to just give you a, a, a company overview and the project vision and scope. So just kind of an over overview of, of uh, why First Energy decided to do this, the project resources and the, how that was organized and how the teams you know, were, were structured. And then we'll go into designing the data models just to support all the target processes. So meaning, you know, of course, the utility network is just, you know, uh, one piece of the puzzle. There's uh, other enterprise systems that um, the, the UN needed to be integrated with. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll go into uh, just uh, preparing and migrating the data um, and some details about how that, how we went about that. And then conclude with just going over some of the end results and benefits to First Energy. Um, and then Jamie's going to close this out with uh, the lessons learned, which is going to be super interesting. All right, so we would like to ask you all a question so that we can kind of get an idea for where you all might be with respect to the utility network. So the question, and you'll see this come up so that you can all give a, an answer. You'll see that on your screen. Question is, what is your biggest perceived challenge in transitioning to the utility network? So give everybody some time to answer those questions or answer the question. Sixty-three percent of you voting. That's good. That's a good turnout. Sixty-five. Okay. Let's see what we've got there. We gave it about a minute for everybody to answer. So we've got a few more trickling in. Let's see. So now I'm going to share the results. Interesting. So it looks like uh, a couple different answers there. Not 
sure the technology is mature enough and the quality of my data may create issues. That actually is somewhat expected. So kind of some answers all over, um, but that helps a lot. I think that's really interesting results. Hey, I'm going to uh, now pass it over to Jamie so she can start giving you a, an overview of the uh, First Energy and the project. Thanks, Bill. So you may need still... to hide the hide poll the results answer. from the poll. Gotcha. Got it. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't surprised with those results either. That's really great. And I think that's, you know, kind of what we're here to talk about. So, you know, it's really, really in line with what we were thinking that everybody would want to hear. So that's good. So a little bit, you know, about First Energy, just to kind of set the stage on who we are and, and what we did. Uh, we are across five states. We're actually 10 operating companies. So we operate, uh, you know, across different utility, um, you know, regulators, right? And we have six, about six million customers. We do have three regional databases, and they're pretty evenly matched with two million customers each. Uh, they don't they don't line up exactly with the states or anything like that, but it's more about you know load, and they're about two million customers each. Just wanted to make sure, you know, we talked about that because we will show the databases and in, in some of the future slides. So we can move on to kind of you know why we did this project, right? So five-ish years ago, we took a look at uh, what the regulators wanted us to do, especially in Ohio, and they wanted us to come up with a ADMS and advanced applications inside of that ADMS. And then when you look across the board, you know it's really important to have a robust GIS for that ADMS and data, and we'll get into more of that in a couple slides, but. You know, we looked at our GIS then and said, well, this is really end of life. We were on, you know, an auto desk, highly customized, only person on it. You know, it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't a good, robust situation. Uh, our mappers and our designers were working in the same program and it was not something that we wanted to use going forward to support an ADMS. So we said, okay, you know, let, let's look at that. And then what, where do we go? You know, what do we do? What, what other GISs are out there? And we looked at you know market strength and performance, interoperability. Our transmission department was already on Esri, uh, and then of course you know the market strength of Esri is is hard to argue with. Uh, so that's that's kind of why. Uh, and then you know the next slide I'll get in a little bit of, of what. So we have our you know project scope. And I talked about the ADMS, so that was a, a big, you know, thing that we were doing. Um, and, and I'll talk about it in, a, in another slide, but, you know, ADMS and GIS were under the same project. So we reported to the same director. So that's why, you know, ADMS is on here as well. And then I talked about how our designers and mappers were in the same system. So if we replaced our GIS, we also had to replace our design software. So, you know, right off the gate, that's three large software implementations that we were doing all at once. Uh, the advanced applications, so you know, automation and volt var control, those were also included in the ADMS rollout. For the uh, mobile work software, with the ADMS rollout, they also looked at how do we perform our storms, and for damage assessment, they decided to roll out iPads. So we said, okay, well, for design, that's a lot of those damage assessors are designers. They're already getting these iPads, so let's also roll out, you know, a design mobile system. So that, that's part of our suite now too. And then at the very beginning, um, we were kind of waiting for UN and what we were gonna do there. We decided to do a conflation effort. Uh, so that really helped you know, line up our assets. We purchased some imagery, we sent it out to Scient and they helped us you know, kind of put those together with our, our current, you know, we, we did it on the old system and our old GIS data and just kind of did that conflation. We gave everybody a little bit of taste of, here's what our GIS will be in the future. It'll be more accurate and more powerful. Um, and then we were able to kind of say, okay, now we can move forward with ADMS and all of these other things that we wanted to do. So normally I would pause there for questions. So if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll ask them at the end. Uh, but this is our solution. So this is what we decided on. Um, some of these we already had and some of these were new. Uh, so we went with an Oracle NMS. That's our the ADMS that we're using. Cruise is an in-house 
you know, highly customized. Again, that's our work management solution. Uh, DDS is who we went with. That's GSI's DDS, who we went with for our graphic work design. Gatekeeper was another one that we already had. So that's our GIS viewer. Uh, so we're not currently using the Esri, Esri portal for that, you know, view only. We are using Gatekeeper in their GIS view. Of course, Esri. And then uh, we did use some SSP, you know, uh, productivity for the, the GIS data editing, as well as some things on the back end, like Lifecycle and Delta and some of the other SSP products. Uh, SSP was also, I think I might have it on the next slide, but also the implementer for GIS. Yes, <laughs> I did have it on the next slide. So yeah, at the top there with the vendors, I'll start there since I just talked about our solutions. Uh, GIS implementer, we did go with SSP. So we said, well, we liked their products. We liked some of the things that they were doing. So they're gonna go ahead and you know implement Esri for us or with us, I should say. Uh, they did subcontract Ramtech to be our migration vendor. So I know, you know Phil's gonna talk about migration in a little bit. But we really worked, you know, very, very closely with SSP and Ramtech and Esri. Um, you know, Esri had skin in the game. They really, they were here. They were helping us all along the way. I did mention Scient. You know, they kind of helped us with the conflation, and, and that was the first thing we did. We also had some partners come in and help us from an overall project management point of view. Um, Deloitte was the first one. They came in. They helped us set up. How many people do we need on the project? You know what's the schedule look like they even helped us say okay what editing tool were we going to go with when we were still looking um, between ssp and others we had boreas come in they came in at first with deloitte they came in and did our you know data assessment to say these are you know where we recommend for adms specifically this is what we recommend you to you know clean up to have a, a good you know functioning adms in the future and then uh, I think Phil's going to talk about the actual data remediation effort that we did, but we also then had Boreas come back and help us with that. Uh, GSI was our design solution, and then we had Accenture over both parties, over the ADMS and the GIS, to kind of make sure that you know schedules lined up, and A was talking to B, and you know kind of the overall uh, advisory there. But one huge um, advantage i guess that first energy really had and you know I, I do a lot of these talks and get a lot of questions and the project team and the dedication of the project team always comes up uh, it, it, it was huge it was really you know led to the success of the project that we had a dedicated project team i mentioned a minute ago we had a director over adms and gis and design of course and uh you know he had all of these managers these were all fully staffed groups um, you know, GIS, of course, myself, I had a data engineer, which was extremely helpful. When you talk about the ADMS data and advanced applications, you know, that's not something that a GIS analyst normally has to know. Um, all the engineering that went behind that and why we need to clean up all the step banks and, and all the other things that go along with that, that was extremely helpful. Also, our design program has some engineering calculations in it and helping build those, you know, the engineer was able to help us with that as well. We of course had GIS and design, subject matter experts. Um, and then another thing I recommend is usually the business analyst. So we had somebody that was doing, you know, the PowerPoints and the update slides and, you know, of uh, communications across, you know, leadership and everything else and making sure all the, you know, kind of parts stayed together. Um, I had a business analyst that reported to me and that, that was super helpful too. Um, we also still had an entire QA organization you know, they helped with the, some of the project management, they helped with testing, they helped with requirements and keeping track of all that stuff, auditing, all of those things. Um, I'm gonna skip IT for a second. We had a PMO organization, vendor management, schedule. Uh, the vendor management piece is, is huge. We had, as you can see, a lot of vendors and that was just on our side. We also had the whole ADMS side. Uh, and change management. Of course, you know, everybody knows change, manage, change management is important. We had an entire team dedicated to change management, you know, trainers, documentation, and those two things alone could be full-time jobs. Uh, we also had them help us. Uh, I talk about getting the um, organization ready in a couple slides, and, and this, that was really our change management organization that did that. Uh, IT, so they were not completely dedicated to the project. They still had to support our legacy systems, but our legacy systems were frozen. Uh, they really only had to support critical issues 
and they were mostly dedicated to our project. Um, you could see the number is pretty high there. It took a lot of people dedicated to our project uh, to get this, get this really successful. So now that we talked a little bit about you know the who and the why and the what, um, we, we are going to jump into a little bit more of the you know UN and the data model and the migration. So wanted to show our timeline. Uh, we kind of started you know setting this up in 19, and we're pretty proud of the fact that we went live within only a few months of what we thought back in 19. Uh, some of you may remember in 2020 we had a global pandemic, which. Uh, we'll talk about when we get to lessons learned, but you know, we really, in I think it was right about 21 um, after we saw the prototype and the pilot that we kind of took a time out and we said, okay, we've been dealing with a lot of things. We're seeing a lot of issues with the prototype and the pilot. Let's reevaluate this entire schedule. Um, it was it was a painful process, but we did it. It was super important, and we got back on track and we went live within that schedule that we came up with. Uh, I think it was actually early 22 that we finalized that schedule. So, you know, we did do a prototype and a pilot. Both of those were on one instance each. We, you know, were able to see a lot, make a lot of decisions based on, on those. So then when we got to the mocks, we did each one of those three times. So we did each mock for the east, the south, and the west. And then we were able to sort of make, they were, they weren't in parallel, um, but they weren't, we didn't wait for one either. So they were, they were just offsettled enough that we were able to kind of make decisions in between each one, which was extremely helpful. Um, the migration rule changes, you can see in the blue, you know, that's what I'm talking about. We were able to make some rule changes. We were able to make some tweaks to UN, tweaks to our data remediation, all of that kind of happening as we're going through, you know, the mock. And then, of course, you know, we did testing with each one of those. That's the green where we say release testing. And at the very bottom, that's our kind of overall testing that we did with our, you know, our DDS. We did it with Esri. We did it with productivity. And we did it with the data. So a lot, a lot, a lot of testing going on. And then the training in the brown there, it's, uh, you know, probably could have been a little bit longer, but we did want to wait until we had our data model pretty well figured out. Uh, the screens looked a little bit different every time we changed the data model. You know, DDS might have been a little bit different if they had to do something to create a different piece of the data model. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I know there was a question already in the chat about the phased cutover. So we did it by instance. Uh, so it was, it was not entirely Big Bang, but we did them pretty close together. We didn't want people going live and especially because our design program and our mapping were the same so it was it was difficult for us to say well we can we can do this section and this section we kind of had to go live together so uh it, we had we did have a freeze period so that's why the phase cutover starts before those stars happen um but we you know tried to get that all done as, as short as possible we are still dealing with the ramifications of that however i saw a report today that had uh, the backlog that we're still dealing with after that freeze period so it, it was significant but um that's how we did it so i'm going to turn it over to phil so he can talk a little bit more specifically thank you jamie okay so this slide uh this topic i kind of want to spend a little time on especially since we had the poll results talking about the concern over the quality of data so before I before I dive into this, I also wanted to mention that Kristen Conrad at First Energy, she um, really was the one leading this effort with the data remediation and the migration, and she did a wonderful job. We're going to tell you something at the end of this presentation about how you could possibly, um, if you're going to be at IMGIS, talk to her in person and and ask your questions in person, which is a great would be a great opportunity. So we'll tell you about that a little bit later. So talking about just preparing and migrating the data, this is obviously a big topic we could probably set here um, for most of the day. Um, but just briefly, you know, this was one of the key um, points, I think, which led to this, the success of First Energy implementing the utility network because of the way they treated um just the condition of their data and how quickly they they engaged and took 
uh, ownership of it and just this the sense of urgency and organization that they took in forming teams to really get the data in in working order in a in a in a relatively uh, short amount of time so in q1 of 2020 at that point in time in the project there was 11 separate um, remediation projects underway um, by the time we hit q3 of 2021 there was 64 in total so if you if we're looking at the you know the, the graphic on the right there um, just to kind of break this down there were some different you know types of data anomalies that we were looking at um, we, we categorized them into critical data which really just means data that needed to be migrating over from the existing system which was Autodesk CAD based um, which made this whole thing unique for First Energy right we're not going from Esri to Esri here so that just um, created a whole unique set of, of um, issues with the data. The second part, of course, what the UN needed to operate and do, um, you know, UN, you know, functions, uh, tracing and, and all of the capabilities that we wanted to achieve in the UN. And then there was a third uh, part of this, which was ADMS. So that, that was related to, you know, the output of data that ADMS um, needed to have, which was, like Jamie said earlier, one of their major goals of doing this was to have better data for the ADMS system. So we needed to consider that early on. We didn't want to get to the end of the project and realize that we're not providing the right data. So we got ahead of that um, so that we could form teams to remediate any, uh, any of that data. So there were, um, you know, at, I think at the peak, uh, of the project, which I believe was in 2021 for the data remediation effort, there were 64 separate projects going on to remediate the data. So, so, so now let me talk about, okay, well, when you say remediate the data, um, how did you get to that point? We did a lot of um, analysis and reporting. We used a product called G-Ready. Um, Ramtech puts out that tool. It was a great tool. Um, SSP was able to help First Energy decipher the results of that tool. Um, it's a lot of raw data, but we were able to sort of group and organize that and, and um, help First Energy um, kind of organize their efforts and their teams to remediate the data. A lot of that um, was simply mass updating you know, data um, in their source system. Um, as you can see there, there was over 500,000, you know, fixes for the critical data that were just fixed with scripts and then there was quite a bit um, over 31,000 that um, were just manual edits so that was a lot of that was a lot of labor a lot of effort um, that went into this all three of those categories had a mix of scripted fixes and manual fixes and then there was also um, a, some of this that we fixed which just simply changing the way that we were migrating the data, uh, the rules. Um, this was a, a pretty complicated um, data migration, considering this was not going from Esri to Esri. It was, um, you know, CAD data. It was still in an Oracle database, but it was uh, quite challenging. But because of, we just had a fully engaged team across the board with First Energy and all of the vendors, including SSP, we just were really able to achieve something that was was pretty pretty amazing. So some of the, you know, you might be asking yourself, you know, what did you run into? You know, what were some of the problems? Well, um, any of you that kind of understand a little bit about, you know, what goes into the UN, there's topology errors, right? And those were significant because um, you know the topology that was present in the in the Autodesk system is is just not in alignment with what was needed in the UN. So there was a lot of work there. Just connectivity issues. You know the uh, Autodesk data was nodal connectivity. Um, you know and so a lot of the the migration of that needed to go into associations because we did not have coincident geometry and uh, a lot of that uh, connectivity. Just child records, 
you know, unit records on various devices that needed to be resolved because the data was tracked a little bit different um, in the existing system versus what we had targeted in the in the new UN model. And then just duplicate geometry and duplicate phasing, things like that, you know, where you had, um, you know, stacked um, device points that needed to somehow be resolved. And um, a lot of that, um, you know, we had uh, simple migration rules like offsetting, depending on the type of device it was. Um, so there was a lot, there was a lot of thought and a lot of discussions we spent hundreds of hours um, on calls um, determining what needed to be done to make this all happen. Okay, let me talk briefly just about some end results. Um, Jamie talked earlier about conflation, which really happened kind of before the UN um, project started, but that was a significant effort that you know, over 57 million features conflated to 10 foot accuracy before we even started. So that was a really good um, exercise to go through to get that data um, conflated. Like we talked about early data remediation. So, you know, we were able to, to remediate 94% 94, 94 um, of the, the manual data changes, um, uh, which is a, a really good, that's a significant um, percentage because there's, you know, obviously all, probably all of you on this call uh, know what it would take to, you know, to have that that many edits manually done. So that was that was a, quite the accomplishment. And the schedule adherence within 5% of the original four year timeline, that was incredible because a lot can happen in four years. So that really comes from just um, really deliberate um and you know very focused leadership on the project so um you know first energy definitely um gets the credit for that for keeping this project on the timeline and then the data migration so after we finished the two mocks um you know we one of the measurements that we had for the you know the data migration was can we get the subnetworks to build and after the two mocks, it was over 96%, which it's even, it was even higher by the time we went, um, you know, went live, but that was a very good um, percentage. I think we were targeting 90%, if I remember correctly, Jamie, but so we kind of exceeded that. So that was, that was when we kind of knew that things were going to probably um, go very well for the project. Change management, just excellent training execution and and just being ready for the go live just a lot of preparation um proper planning getting people involved making sure they're tr they're trained properly that was a huge part of um, just the success uh, in the go live all right let me talk um through some of the you know the first energy benefits that they they you know experience from going to the UN. Now, kind of qualify this by saying that some of these are a little more kind of um, benefits from going to Esri from Autodesk. So some of these might be kind of no-brainers to some of you, but they were significant to First Energy. Um, so in, in under editing and analysis, the branch versioning was a big thing for them. That's not something they didn't have any versioning in Autodesk. So that was in and of course, branch versioning is a lot easier to manage and, and maintain um, than the traditional brand, the traditional versioning that we're used to. Querying and tracing, so obviously getting tracing capability to do summaries and things, that's that's new. Um, First Energy had historically just really ran SQL queries and, and generated reports and things uh, to do querying. And then all the toolboxes um, that are available. In, in, in ArcGIS Pro, um, those um, are very useful for First Energy and were um, kind of a pleasant surprise to them to see all the capabilities. Um, in their old system, they had to basically lock out a geographic area if they were going to edit, and then nobody else could edit those features in that area. So that's um, behind them since they can now, obviously. 
And then um, the integration to the OMS system. Um, so all of the updates from the circuits that changed and anything on any circuit um, is automatic. So once the edits got posted to default, that automatically goes downstream to OMS. So that's a, that was a huge value. On the workflows, just in the editing and the job workflow, um, being able to go from you know design um, all the way to um, you know reviewing and approving the work and posting it to default and making it available in all the maps. So that workflow was carefully thought out and designed, and that was a huge uh, benefit. And then like work transfer for reviews, I mentioned that just being able to you know with uh, productivity to be able to transfer work or approve it or decline it or you know those workflows for the editing group templates is a big one um a lot of work up front but the benefits definitely are there um, on the long term if you put you know the effort into that so first energy really saw a lot of value in that and then um just uh, the maps right so the executive maps you know storm maps status mapping tree outage prediction all of that you know being able to create those maps in portal that was a you know, that was something new to First Energy and, and um, is going to really um, continue to be valued to them, to them moving forward. So. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Jamie so she can talk about how they prepped the organization. Yeah, thanks, Phil. So that was a lot of work that Phil just went over. Um, but at the same time, we also had to prep the organization for all of these new things that were coming. You know, we couldn't have achieved any of those benefits if the users were like, eh, we're not going to use that. Uh, so, you know, what we did during the project is we had meetings with the external, with the leadership, you know, the internal leadership, but, you know, external to the project. We have talked to, you know, the actual users leadership and made sure that they were on board with some of the changes that we were making and also prepared for some of the, you know, like the freeze period and some of the not so great things, the learning curve and, and some of those things. We did have a couple process workshops. Uh, the first process workshop was an as is workshop. It was before the pandemic. It was in person. We got really good engagement. You know, we really felt like people were you know, open and honest about the way that the processes were today and what wasn't working for them. We were super excited, we took that back, we made some changes, you know, we looked at our scope and said, what are these can we help with? And then we went to do as is workshops in March of 2020. So we you know, kind of waited till the summer to see if things cleared up. I mean, you guys know that whole story. So we did them virtually and to be honest, it, it was a fail. Um, you know, People attended, but there wasn't engagement. We didn't have video back then even available. Uh, I'm not even sure how many people had the right setup in their house and monitors. And we had people still trying to work on desktops that they brought back. It, it was a mess. Um, and we really, we felt that through the rest of the project. So we had change agents and you know the change management organization really handled this. They had, uh, I think it was quarterly change agent meetings where they pulled in select users to talk to and say, okay, well, this is how the project's going. This is what we're thinking. You know, what kind of feedback do you have for us? Um, we didn't have a lot of feedback that way, but we did at least get the message out that we didn't honestly get out in those process workshops in the 2B ones. We also had coordinator calls, and this wasn't something new. This was something that we had before. Our legacy system had coordinator calls, mostly attended by the supervision, the uh, you know, design and mapping supervision, and talk about you know, stuff, those are monthly calls, talk about stuff that they would normally, you know, talk about. How is this process? Is this working well? All of those things. Uh, so we were able to kind of interject ourselves into that and say, okay, well, here's also what the project can do. And this is what we're thinking for the project. And just kind of get them used to hearing some of the new lingo, some of the new terms, you know, processes, things like that. So that worked, worked pretty well. Uh, during implementation, of course, you know, I talked about the training earlier. It was three days. Uh, we still were not comfortable going back into the office, so it was all virtual. Uh, for the ESRI, I, I think that would, worked okay. For the design, it did not. Uh, we've had a lot of complaints about how training was handled on the design side of things. So much, in fact, that I'm going out and doing roadshows over the next six months to refresh the designers. Uh, it did include instructions and hand-on you know exercises so everybody was at home with their monitors and their computers and they were able to kind of follow along hands-on in the system 
Then during implementation, actually during the go lives, we did have a hotline that people could call into and um, you really, nobody did. <laughs> what people really used was the Teams chat line. Uh, so people were able to kind of ask their question. Everybody that's in that Teams channel can see it, including peers. So peers could see it and they could maybe answer. They didn't so much then, but they actually do now. This is still live. And my team was able to answer. So they had you know, SMEs available to them during business hours and they were able to answer some of those questions. Um, and I skipped Ask the Expert because really we took some of those questions that we were getting from you know, the Teams chat, and we actually have an email set up too that goes you know, to my team to manage. So the questions that we were getting on there, when we started getting the same question over and over, then we said, all right, let's have an Ask the Expert session. These are an hour long, virtual, you know, a lot like what we're doing now, where an expert would get on and, and talk about a topic. We would usually leave time for questions and we actually, we're still doing these too. They were weekly for a while. I think they're they maybe bi-weekly or monthly now, um, but it's really, we get really good feedback on those. It's a time for people to ask questions, but also a time for us to say, hey, this is the best way to do something. And sometimes that changes. We might've made an update and now we can say, okay, this is the new best way to do something. We still have those regional coordinator calls too. Those are ongoing. So of course, we learned some lessons through all of this. Um, and this is my favorite slide. I will probably talk about this. Oh, I pr probably could talk about this for the last 20 minutes, but I'm gonna leave time to, ask, to answer some questions. Uh, we talked about the schedule um, and how proud we were about that we were you know, sort of on time, but we did have a pretty tight bill schedule. You know, I talked about when we came together and said, okay, is this, is this a schedule we're gonna get behind? And uh, I think if you, there's more details, Phil, if you click again. But um, we did have that, you know, it, it, was, it was challenging, but we, we did it. So, you know, advice to you would be make sure you identify and mitigate those timeline risks, um, kind of like we did when we paused halfway through. Uh, and actually, the reason that it came up was because of our prototype and our pilot. You know, we saw those and we said, okay, there's a lot going on here. Um, you know, the, the prototype was, was only really five circuits and the pilot was 22. So if we're only looking at these small amount of circuits, and when we get to MOX and it's a full database, what is that gonna look like? Uh, so that's you know where we said, okay, we've learned a lot. It's been a few years, let's, let's re-engage and, and, and mitigate those risks. And we were really able to do that. I talked about having a dedicated project team, but honestly, there was still limited resources. Uh, there's not, First Energy did not have any ESRI knowledge, really. Um, certainly no UN knowledge. Uh, that was limited across the industry, to be honest. Uh, we had, um, you know, Phil talked about the data remediation, where we then went back and pulled in Boreas and ex internal designers and mappers, and we had them, you know, as testers and as trainers. So we still felt like we had limited resources, even though we were lucky to have a dedicated project team. The migration rules, you know, we needed agile test plans because if we changed the migration rule, then we had to change the test plan. And then moving on integrations, if we changed the migration rule, we also had to change the integration. So, you know, the integrations was a big challenge point. Uh, some of the vendors, really all the vendors had never integrated to UN before. So not only were we changing our data model, but it was also UN in general. Uh, what really helped us there was having a strong you know, IT business and really probably should have put vendor collaboration all along the way. You know, We all had to be in sync, very tightly in sync. Uh, data remediation, um, you know, we talked about that a lot, but one of the things that you know, we're kind of telling people is to perform a pretty early UN data assessment. So if you can get something like that G-Ready a little bit earlier, um, that would help. Or you know maybe learning your internal resources more about UN. We took a couple UN classes through Esri, they were great, but we really didn't apply them to our data. We said, okay, now we know about UN, let's see what happens in the migration. But if we were able to, you know, I, I don't even know how we could have done that ourselves because we were using you know, RamTech heavily and SSP heavily as well, but just, just learning a little bit more, we would have felt a little bit more prepared. Um, and then, of course, we talked about the global pandemic, uh, frequent communication, check-ins, uh, everything that we did you know, in person now had to be virtual. 
I was at a conference last week with the DDS vendor, GSI, and they were, you know, kind of razzing me because we had a really sticking point in the contract that they would be on site every single week, Tuesday through Thursday. He's like, yeah, we were able to do it without being on site, weren't we? And I said, yeah, well, it wasn't fun, right? So we were on Teams meetings constantly, and, and it was really just a lot of sitting in one spot meeting. Um, and, you know, you lose a lot. You lose a lot of interaction that way. And, you know, I noticed that some of the vendors that we were able to be on site with, we had a better relationship with, you know, than some of the newer vendors maybe that came in at the end. So um, there's a lot, a lot there. I probably could give an entire hour presentation just on this, um, but I won't. We'll we'll move on because we do have some questions to answer. We have a lot of questions. But before we go to questions, here's our little um, advertisement. Um, Kristen, who Phil talked about before, she really led the data um, the data remediation effort on the project, but she also now owns the applications after go live. Uh, she's going to be at IMGIS. I unfortunately will not be there, but uh, Kristen will. So come see her, uh, especially at the bottom one there with the ice cream social at the SSP booth. So if you have you know more questions after listening to this or after listening to her talk in the first two sessions, you know that'll be a, a question and answer where you can kind of come to the SSP booth and ask her your questions, and she'll be able to answer those. Okay, I think we're ready for uh, questions. So I'm going to read one um, that makes sense for you to answer, Phil. Um, did you use the Esri Electric Foundation model? If so, to what extent did you have to customize it? We, we do get this question a lot. Yeah, we get that question a lot, and I can really nerd out on this one, but I, I won't. I'll just <laughs> answer it, right? Um, because I was heavily involved in the data model. Um, from the very beginning and the answer to the question the short answer is yes we did use now keep in mind this was four years ago um, that model was pretty new it was a great model as we put out a great model it was um, what we would consider to be a high fidelity model um, so we had to make a lot of changes to it to um, accommodate what first energy was trying to do with the UN Right. So, and plus we were trying to figure out the model as we went. So there was a lot of changes that just happened just to see, okay, what happens if we do this? Right. Um, I always tell people this number and it's shocking to them, but um, I kept track of all the changes we made because um, SSP has tools that we use to uh, make changes to the data model through an automated means so I can keep track of everything that's changed. And by the time we got to the end of the project, there were over 20,000 changes we made to the to the foundation model, the electric foundation model. Now that sounds scary, um, but a lot of those were just simple domain value changes that we kind of moved in and out and some of them we added and then we decided to delete them. And so um, a lot of those were just simply bulk edit changes, but that's still a lot. Um, specifically, we made a lot of changes um, to the asset types. Um, so, in the, and those kind of went back and forth for a while. We made a lot of changes to the data model because it, um, we were really trying to, you know, kind of pioneer this from the from the Esri model, um, which thankfully we had as a starting point. But yes, um, we had to change it um, quite a bit. But I think everybody in the industry right now, especially um, I know that at SSP, we've learned a lot about the data models and have been working closely with Esri. So um, yeah, I think we know a lot more about kind of what works well and you know, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, um, I think you, I have a question that I think would be a good one for you, Jamie. Um, I think you might have answered this already, but you can go ahead and, in case it, somebody, some folks didn't hear it. Uh, the question is, what was included in the prototype versus the pilot versus the mock? Yeah, so um, the prototype was five circuits and we said, you know, we're not sure what UN is gonna look like. We wanna make sure that these five circuits are ones that we actually think are pretty clean. We said, we clean these up for ADMS. We know they're going to be running advanced applications on these circuits. So let's use those. And 
but we felt pretty good about that, right? And then it came back and was like, yeah, UN doesn't care <laughs> if it's you know cleaned up. You think it's clean because UN looks at things a different way. So that was kind of an eye opener right there. Uh, the next one, the pilot was 22 circuits. And these we tried to take a mix of, let's try to get as many devices as we can. Let's try to get you know different areas of the company so we can say, well, this was you know a longer circuit, a shorter circuit, things like that. And what we found out with that is it didn't matter as much. You know, the UN had its rules, it applied its rules, and we saw a similar response, similar you know results than we did from the uh, prototype. So that's when we said, like I said a couple times, you know, that's when we said, all right, let's pause, let's learn from this, um, because the next thing we were doing was the entire database. Um, and one of the reasons we did that was the way that our in, Phil probably understands this better than I do, but the way that our um, architecture was, when we actually only sent a few circuits at a time, we were missing a lot of data also. Uh, we were missing, I think, some of the structural connectivity and things like that, where when we sent an entire database, then it was able to say, okay, this is everything. This is literally what we're going to be migrating. And then we had a whole new set of, okay, we thought this was clean, and here is, is kind of what we were able to learn from that. So hopefully, hopefully that answered the question. Um, now I get to ask you one. I think I need to scroll. There's so many questions here. Um, oh, okay, here's a good one, Phil. I do get this one a lot too. Uh, did you use associations and containers and did they considerably slow down the system? If they did, did adding more server power solve the problem? Really good question. Um, yeah, I got that one um, from a few folks too that just emailed me randomly and asked me about that because they saw, my, saw our talk at the UC. Um, we did not use a lot of uh, containment, we did use, it, a lot of associations because of what I talked about earlier, you know, coming from the AutoCAD um, connectivity, nodal connectivity, that's the solution we had because we had to use associations. Um, I think in the largest um, of the region databases, um, there were over 4 million associations. So let's just put it this way. We really exercise the performance of the associations for Esri, as we tested it for them. Um, and they were incredible about responding to that um, because the performance was not good in the beginning. And we identified that very quickly and we're concerned about it. Esri really was responsive and worked closely with us all along the way, even all the way to go live. Um, so we were able to do um, a few things. Number one, um, some patches that Esri provided us, we, we applied those. But number two, we had originally uh, architected the servers, um, you know, the, the ArcGIS server servers um, to be virtual. And we had, I think, um, six of them for the UN um, site. And then ultimately at the end um, with Esri's assistance in helping us with that, we ended up going with two physical servers. Um, and that actually boosted performance significantly. I think they, um, we had a terabyte of memory on each of those. And I think, uh, um, I can't remember how many um, CPUs we had on them, but there was a lot. I think it was, yeah, it was like 64, I think. So we, the first energy did throw a lot of hardware at that, and it turned out to really be beneficial and and performing to where they um, saw as um, satisfactory. Okay, so Jamie, I think there's another good one here for you to answer. Um, to what level do you map to? Essentially, do you map from the breaker down to the meter, including the secondary and service conductors, or do you just map and track the feeder, primary poles, transformers? 
It is a good one. That is a good one. It's one we probably should have covered. Um, uh, we we really do it all, um, but I say that kind of with an asterisk because some of our locations, especially where they say, okay, well, the map's getting really cluttered and I don't want to put all these services, uh, and maybe they don't model the service then and they just connect the service point directly to the transformer. But we do. We model all the way through to the service. Um, you know, that was an issue that we've heard others with, you know, utility network and we experienced a little bit ourselves is we don't know maybe what the service is, if it's customer owned. And, you know, with UN, we're trying to add domains and trying to really clean that up. But how do you force that if you don't know what it is? So that was one of the things that we kind of backed off for UN. We said, well, maybe we don't care as much about the service. We'll just kind of let that go. We know it's not accurate. We talked to the ADMS team and we said, when you're looking at advanced apps, kind of just stop at the transformer. You know, SIME from a planning point of view was already kind of aggregating everything to the transformer. So let's just let's just do it that way. But yes, we do map all the way down uh, to the service point as well as poles and all that other stuff. Uh, but I think I did see another one um, for you, Phil. Um, Okay, so I think, Phil, either one of us could probably answer this. I'm gonna let you start it because you can probably give more of the, the details and then you know anything high level I can probably give too. Uh, so were there any challenges in integration with other systems? Can you briefly explain how you have overcome them? Yeah, let me start. You can probably um, add more color to this than I can because you, Obviously, we're um, dealing with all of your other systems and the integrations, but um, yeah, there were challenges. And I think most of the challenges came from the fact that we were so early on in the UN, right? Um, some of the vendors like Oracle um, had very little um, time to kind of come up to speed to, you know, um, build those integrations from what we were providing, which standard would be the JSON um, sub network exports, right? Um, so having to iron that out with um, the vendor, you know, it takes years for those types of things to kind of smooth out. So we were on the cutting edge of that. So that was a challenge. And then trying to figure out also just internal systems like SAP and, you know, First Energy's internal systems, figure out how we were going to uh, mostly um, handle changes that were coming through the UN and GIS um you know trying to figure out a solution that kind of worked across the board i'm gonna let jamie speak to that <laughs> but you know it, it, it's similar right it actually didn't matter as much i don't think between you know if it was an internal or you know something new because it was new to everybody so everything was new uh we even had something with sap and i know there was a question earlier about you know what asset management you know software did we have and we do have sap we don't have a lot in our SAP, but we do have some. Um, and that's an integration that honestly, we sent some information at Go Live from Esri and then it wasn't actually going correctly. We ended up having to kind of undo everything that we had done for those few weeks and then redo it in Esri, how it's sending it over to SAP. So it's just, it's a learning experience all, all around. Um, you know, some of our systems like Cruise that are highly customized and built 30 years ago, we don't have a lot of people on staff that even know the back end of that. So there's a lot of trial and error, a lot of testing. Um, if I could say one thing about testing is give yourself more time for testing than you think you need, because you need to test a lot more um, than we even did. I mean, we were successful, we're live, we didn't have to go backwards, but we're still dealing with a lot of things that it's like, oh, we didn't even know that, or oh, we didn't see that in testing, which is probably also you know, normal. But um, yeah, it was a it was a the integrations in general were probably our, our biggest challenge. Um, Got another good one, Phil. Or you want me to look for one? I'll see. I, I see another one for you. Oh, great. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, how long uh, was your production cutover and freeze period? That is a good one. That is a good one. And I know we're talking to you like, you know, Southern Company and Centerpoint now about what they're going to be doing with their cutover, um, mostly, mostly Centerpoint. But um, our freeze period 
was it was slightly different honestly because of the holidays so we had a six week i think we had a six week and then two eight week freeze periods and that was long uh that's kind of what was necessary for us to take an entire database and send it to ramtech and then get that back uh, and then kind of do our post-processing to get it into our system but and phil might be able to talk about what that post-processing was but uh this the six weeks the designers were not frozen they were able to work in the system but it was now disconnected so whatever they did in the system to do design prints was not going to go to Esri. So the mappers were sort pretty much frozen out of the system because anything they did, they could do critical things, but anything they did, they were gonna have to redo. So they would have to keep track of anything they did. And then also all of these things that the designers were doing was now going into their you know, backlog. Um, like I said before, that's kind of, we're still dealing with that. It's the backlog um, is, is has grown from those six weeks. And then also with people now learning curve, of the new system um, so that's something that hopefully we can once we get our feet under us start helping them with um, there was also a little bit of migration fallout that we needed to fix and we tried on our side to help them with that as much as possible you know phil talked about that 96 percent earlier well you know we we can't send that to an adms we need to send 100 percent to the adms so that's something that we you know helped right out of the gate you know try to make sure that we could get as much of that as possible um, i think there was also a question just since I'm talking about the ADMS integration, about the ADMS integration um, was one of the questions earlier. And um, it's actually, I think it's going better than uh, we expected it. We did, like I said, a lot of cleanup and some testing before that. They have a uh, you know, sandbox that they're able to take our data and kind of put it in and make sure it's right before they actually promote it into their, you know, into the NMS. And we get questions from that. Hey, you know, this doesn't look right. Hey, can you fix this? And we work with them and the local mappers and we fix it before it gets to NMS. So that's actually, um, you know, going pretty well. It's, it's taking some time and we're starting to get some complaints about how long it's taking, but it's a new system. It's a learning curve. We're still ironing it all out. Um, so that's, you know, something we're, uh, we're looking forward to improving. I know we're like at three minutes. So um, do we want to take one more, Phil? Yeah, I mean, it's, see if you can find one in there that you think maybe for me, it's fine. Most of these I think are for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like they this one. Hear, they want to hear from you, Jamie. <laughs> I talk a lot anyway. What, uh, what method or commercial technology product do you use to map and send Esri network model to OMS, ADMS? I think that's a good one and I think, um, Phil, the answer is JSONs, but also, so the, the native JSONs from Esri, but then also, you know, we use some of the SSP products, correct? We use like Delta to make sure that we capture everything. It's, and that's what helps us send the JSON. Maybe you should answer that one. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's a combination of things. So SSP productivity captures um, the changes that were made to the, the subnetwork and then exports the JSON out to, to be in it, uh, sent to a drop location where OMS picks that up. And um, the Oracle team built their own adapter, which picks those JSON files up and processes those and updates the OMS system. But that's kind of um, one of the big advantages of the fully integrated solution that's, in, you know, productivity is integrated um, into the editing workflow. So where it picks up all that stuff automatically and so their editors, they don't, you know, they have to monitor it, of course, to make sure everything's flowing correctly, but it's, 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 it's automated. And then you mentioned Delta too. So Delta is a part of that. Delta, uh, SSP Delta tracks all the changes to the, even the attributes that you make and the geometry. And so there's other downstream, you know, integrations that benefit from that. That's, that's kind of um, some of the integrations that First Energy built were built on that. I think that's perfect timing. I think we're, uh, I we're, we're good. seconds away from the top of the hour. So um, I did want to mention to everybody that we will answer all of your questions. So even if we mm -hmm. didn't get to, obviously there was a lot of questions we didn't get to. We are going to answer all of those and get those answers back to you. So um, I guess we'll uh, pass it back to PJ. Thanks, Phil, and thanks, Jamie. Fantastic presentation. I think our audience would agree. For our audience, 
we hope as we we think we can tell that you've enjoyed today's discussion but as you log off please take a minute and fill out our feedback survey let us know how you think it went let us know where we can improve so we can continue to provide you with quality content thank you all for participating in today's event this concludes today's discussion